Hi, welcome to Culture Determined. On Blogging Heads TV, I'm your host, R.A. Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is James Ponawazek. Uh, James, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm James Ponawazek, author of Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television, and the Fracturing of America, and TV critic for The New York Times. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I'm holding the book up to the camera. It has a great cover. Uh, people can see it's kind of Trump through the generations with the generations of television uh, stacked on top of one another. Um, so I uh, really enjoyed this book and it's kind of, I've probably been like waiting for a book like this to um, tackle, <laughs> tackle Trump and, t- and TV together. So I, I really enjoyed it. It's really uh, well written for, it's kind Thanks. of a, you know, cultural history, political history, uh, technological communications history. Uh, so you have a lot of stuff in here. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned the title because I actually really like the title when they designed it, too. And the thing that I thought was neat about it is that, like, it kind of gets that aspect of the book across to me. In other words, it is both. A, it, it's a book about two things. Number one, which is Donald Trump's presentation of himself as a television character basically over the years and the evolution of, of TV and screen media, you know, that that cultural history. Uh, so I thought that that that. That little that little picture kind of conceptualizes that nicely. Yeah. Um, so, and I, you know, I think as the TV critic for the one of the TV critics for the Times, you're an ideal uh, person to write this cultural history. Okay. So you you cut you start with uh, way back, and what's maybe the first confirmed <laughs> instance we have of Donald Trump watching TV, and you start with the um, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Is that that's right? Uh, and, and how? Yeah. Trump reports that, I, I guess in Art of the Deal, um, that his his mom watched that um, when he was a child. He would have been about seven years old. And uh, can you talk about why about that about why you chose to to start the the book there? Um. Yeah. Sure. Uh. You know. Number one. Obviously, part of the impetus for the book is you know how did we get to where we are and how did Donald Trump get where he is? Um. And you know, from from my standpoint, he is. He doesn't exist. You know, President Trump doesn't exist without television. He's somebody who has made himself through television. And I wanted to write a book that was not just like current events. You know, I think a lot of people, when they hear about the book, think it's going to be like 300 pages of me, like, you know, ripping on Donald Trump for watching Fox News a lot or whatever. Uh, Like, I really wanted to be writing history. And and I realized the more I looked into it it was that, you know, it's, it's a parallel history of Donald Trump, the person and the the performer, so to speak, and the television medium that that grew up in in, in concert with him. So I'm sort of like writing it as as a, a dual biography because he's literally almost exactly as old as American commercial television. And so this this instance is it's really one of the only lengthy scenes he describes from his childhood in The Art of the Deal, uh, and he talks about he uses it. In that book, he and his ghostwriter, you know, I'm, I'm using him as the author loosely, uh, uh, but he uses it in that book partly to contrast his mother and his father, uh, his father, the businessman, Fred Trump, whose business he went into. Uh, and then there was his his, his mother, who was a, a, a Scottish emigre, who he describes when he was about seven years old watching the coronation of Queen Elizabeth on TV and just being entranced by it. And he talks about how she watched it all day, was mesmerized by the, the, the glamour and the spectacle of it, and his father was like, oh, turn that off. It's a bunch of con artists. You know, this is, this is BS. And in his telling – it is sort of a, a, a distinction between the practical mindedness of his father, Fred Trump, and his mother's, uh, you know, uh, his mother's attraction to, you know, uh, glamour and spectacle and stagecraft, you know, which I think is, you know, that is not a bad framing device for, you know, what Donald Trump becomes. But it's also a contrast, I think, between the, the sort of two businesses that appeal to Donald Trump in his life, one being the real estate business of his father. And one being show business, which has always had this hold on him. When he graduates from college, he talks about how he originally uh, 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 fantasized about going off to Hollywood and going into the movie business. But then he decides to go back in, into the, the, the real estate business and, and to quote in his words, put, put show business into real estate. 
Uh, you know, so, so for me, the, this 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 scene is kind of like a primal scene for him with television. <laughs> and that, like, you know, he, like a lot of people of his generation, is first experiencing and and it's kind of hard to understand this as, as you know, people who have grown up with TV all our lives, but like he's the first generation that's experiencing this, this literal phenomenon of the world coming into your living room for the first time, you know, know, suddenly there are these two different experiences. There's the experience of the real physical world around you. And there's this virtual world that has everything in it. And, and, you know, a little kid of his time, the, the appeal is like, you want to get inside that, that TV set, you know, this like magical box, that entrances your mother and just has splendor and all the possibilities of the world in it. And eventually he becomes like that one lucky little boy who like actually did get to crawl inside the TV set and now is, you know, the star of the news, a 24 hour TV program that is always about the president. Right. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of great stuff there. I mean, just it makes me think of Mike TV from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the little boy yeah. who crawls inside the TV. And yeah, Trump, you know, uh, later on, he becomes the figure who, you know, he embodies the dream of you talk to the TV and TV talks back to you because, you know, uh, po- powerful politicians go on Fox News in order to communicate directly with Trump because they know he'll be watching. But the the, the primal scene is a funny way of putting it um, because, yeah, he, so uh, as you know, we know he has... To biological parents, but maybe television is kind of the third parent in there. And, um, you know, the mom is entranced by the pomp and circumstance of, of this, and the dad is like, these people are con artists. <laughs> and, I mean, Trump as con artist is, of course, a, a theme many people have explored, but, you know, it, Fred Trump was a, like, a hard-headed, hard-hearted businessman, in, uh, from what we can tell, but a kind of a, a standard, you know, real estate guy in his era in New York and he had a lot of like um you know apartments and condos and stuff like in the outer boroughs and you know middle class housing that kind of thing um and so he he was very like you know dollars and cents kind of guy that's what it seems like whereas you know Trump uh, uh, brought in this sense of you know fantasia or like glamour wonder or the sense that like you can change your life by <laughs> moving into one of his buildings um Right, which maybe does come from the mother who wasn't such a you know hard ass <laughs> and awful, it's like, awful person. Yeah, there's there's like a tradition of this, right? The, this this idea of the businessman who succeeds by, uh, you know, a, a creating spectacles for people and you know appealing to their sense of fantasy and possibility. You know, it obviously goes back to you know P. T. Barnum and figures figures like that. Right. Uh, but you know, one thing that I think he intuits as he grows up as a child of the TV era is that, yeah, that, you know, so that sort of thing has, you know, always existed, but television and just living in a mediated culture where more and more of people's experiences come out of what they see on a screen just jacks that up immensely where you, you, it it becomes this sort of postmodern world where the symbols for things and the representations of things and the appearance of things become as powerful and important or more so than the actual things themselves. Uh-huh. Right. So like it, it becomes, it becomes a valuable thing to look like, you know, the public, you know, the, 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 the sort of cartoon shorthand of a businessman before you actually are a successful businessman, because that helps you build a brand and, and something like television is, is, is tremendously, you know, it's just a force multiplier for that. Uh-huh. Um, so, why don't we talk about? Well, I, I think that a little out of order for the book. We talk about the least objectionable programming, um, yeah. which is well, why don't why don't you define this define this term and and, and talk about? I guess, so this at the era of least objectionable programming would have been like maybe like the fifties to like the seventies or so, or does it the, go further than the that? 50s, the fifties to the to the seventies and even early eighties. I mean, essentially, what? Okay, so you know. I talk about this book as sort of a dual biography of, of, of Trump and, and television. And the television part of it, the fracturing of America part that's in the subtitle, uh, is that one thing that changed our television society and television culture and television politics from the mid-20th century to now – Uh, is that we went from an era of extremely mass media, which is, you know, this era when you have three television networks and tens of millions of people are having the same sort of homogenizing experiences to this era that we live in today, 
of cable and the internet and fragmented niche audiences and you know media bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Well, going back to the you know the, the, that origin, that sort of you know very mass mid-century media of the fifties and sixties and seventies. Uh, one popular concept in television programming of the time was coined by an executive in, of NBC was the least objectionable program, and the idea was that in, in these days, you know, in those days when you had only CBS, NBC, and ABC, uh, the 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 ideal program to put on the air was something that did not give people a reason to change the channel. Uh, right. Because, you know, this is the era of Ed Sullivan. It's the era of the big tent, something for everybody. In order for any program to succeed, you have to be able to get and keep an audience of, you know, 30 to, you know, 40 million people. And you have to I mean, you literally inertia is a tremendous part of programming back then. Right. Just 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 as a physical fact. Right. You know, in the 1960s, most people don't have remote controls. So. What you what you stopped watching, you know, the, the the night before would be the the same channel that you would see when you turned on your your TV the next day. You know, it was like the distance between your couch and the TV is like a defensive moat. <laughs> and the least objectionable program, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, a, a broadly appealing kind of a bland programming that didn't offend anybody too much, you know. Leave it to Beaver, uh, you know, Gunsmoke, uh, you know, cop shows with good guys and bad guys. Uh, it was it was unobjectionable and therefore uh, not dangerous. And and sort of broadly speaking, this kind of describes how you know all kind of programming and public presentation uh, was incentivized to be back in in those days. You know, as as a as a you know news programs would have to be more sort of you know, reassuring and, you know, down the middle politicians would present themselves as sort of, you know, cool and smoothly appealing and, you know, or avuncular and, and, and smiley. It, 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 in, in other words, it didn't reward polarizing content or figures as much as the niche era does. So this, this, this era, this, so this, so this beginning era of television is very much driven by this idea of the least objectionable program. Right. And, and, some of the some of the shows that you mentioned, uh, I guess, coming in maybe like the second half of this era, I'll get into like the more surreal stuff that ho- that Hollywood put out, like uh, you know, um, I Dream of Genie or like uh, Green Acres, um, yeah. and semi famously, Trump did a little skit in which he uh, sang the Green Acres song with Megan Mullally at the <laughs> Emmys. Yeah, the 2005 Emmys, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So there's a weird there's a weird connection there, but and then. There was also um, you talk about the how like wealth was like portrayed in the in this era that like you know the Beverly Hillbillies um, you know were showing up the uh, you know the stuffy the stuff shirts who uh, you know who uh, had a lot of money and you know they were like these are you know goofy regular people more or less who uh, just happened to hit strike oil um, yeah. so okay so let's okay so that's kind of the era and then it, i mean the obvious thing that came in and started to disrupt, disrupt that was uh cable television and and then trump kind of his appearance on the tv scene uh aligns more or less with the beginning of the cable era and you you hunted down his first uh tv appearance that we know of and it's in 1980 is that right um uh, with with Tom Brokaw, yeah, with Tom Brokaw. Yeah, at least his his first appearance on um, national television, he'd done like a certain amount of you know local New York talk shows as a real estate developer before then. But yeah, this is his you know this is his first appearance on NBC, which will you know play a large and recurring role in his life you know the, the, thereafter from you know uh, 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 the, you know The Apprentice uh, on through his presidency. Uh, 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 but, um, yeah, so, so he appears on the Today Show in 1980 and 1980 as sort of somebody who studies the cultural history of television is kind of an interesting inflection point for me because it is, it is kind of that cusp point, as you were saying, between the mass three network era of television 
and the the cable era that's about to come up. CNN is just founded in 1980. MTV will start the year after. Uh, you are about to see the start of this fragmentation of the media that will change the programming and the voice of television in decades to come. But right at that point, media is about as mass as it has ever been. You know, it's that summer, the Who Shot JR cliffhanger. Uh, you know, is is on Dallas on CBS and 90 million people watch that. And, and when you watch Donald Trump on this uh, 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 this interview with Tom Brokaw, where he's talking about his plans for Trump Tower and things like how he tore down the Bon Witt Teller building and destroyed the, the Art Deco freezes on it and, and so forth. It's a very different, you know, it's clearly – in some ways, the Donald Trump we know today, and in many ways, very different in terms of uh, uh, diction, and not simply the completeness of his sentences, but sort of his um, presentation of himself as kind of smooth and ingratiating to the audience and, and calming and deflecting controversies rather than inciting them. And, you know, a lot of that difference between then and now have, has to do with a lot of personal evolution factors, but it's all, that's also very much you know, the voice of media at that time, you know, of that like big network Cronkite area era, you know, like a person like Donald Trump sort of has to present himself in a way as the least objectionable program as, as, you know, as, as somebody who is sort of broadly palatable and that character, that character, because, you know, he's a, he's a TV presentation, like a media figure before he really accomplishes anything in business. That character evolves over the years to take advantage of and to accommodate itself to the to the eventual changes in the media environment around him. Mm -hmm. um, so you also uh, hunt down. I think I think this is a separate interview. The one where where he's first asked about running for president. Yeah. Um, and gives uh, I so that I think that's one of the key you know <laughs> key kind of parts. So okay, so he says so he uh, someone asks him you know he's like thirty five or so. Can I, can I just say and the person who asked him because this this to me is like really significant is Rona Barrett, uh, who was a, a famous gossip columnist and TV personality who had been on Good Morning America and then moved to NBC and was producing the special Rona Barrett looks at America's super rich I think some something like that. But I just I to me. As somebody who writes about entertainment and culture, it's like very revealing and sort of gratifying that like it took, you know, kind of a, a gossip columnist, you know, this cultural figure to to be the first one to intuit that a celebrity businessman could be the kind of person who, you know, will someday have great power in the media era. Uh, but anyway, you, you want to you, I mean, so, so she is also, you know, kind of significant. Okay. So yeah. So, she, yeah. so she's, I had never heard of this person before. I guess her time was a bit more before mine, but she's kind of a, you know, like a Liz Smith, um, type person. And like, like, like Liz Smith of morning TV. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so she's, so she asked young, young Trump, um, would you ever run for president? And what is, so what, and what's his answer? And he says, no. And interestingly, he says that one reason that he wouldn't want to is because television has ruined the political process. He's, and he, he says that, you know, it's 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 um, uh, it's an environment in which, you know, somebody like Abe Lincoln, who was homely and didn't speak well, you know, could not could not get elected in a, a television era. And somebody you know, these are, these are his words, somebody with very good ideas that might be controversial or abrasive would lose out to somebody with, in his words, I think it was no great brain, but a big smile. It's very, very, very important to note that this was like a month before Ronald Reagan is elected. So like, like clearly like that notion of like, you know, the, the actor guy with the big smile who can make people comfortable with him. You know, this was very front of mind if you're talking about media and politics at the time. And, you know, in my book, I write about it. I describe this scene. And I sort of cut forward to when he's about to announce his uh, presidential run and he does his last appearance on Fox and Friends in 2015. And they ask him a version of the same question. Don't you think you're maybe too abrasive for, you know, a lot of voters across the country? And he says, well, no, I don't think this is going to be an election really about popularity. You know, and it's kind of the opposite of the thing that he tells Rona Barrett back in 1980. But he's not wrong, you know, either time. You know, what what part of what has happened among many things between 1980 and 2015 is that the media environment has changed so that 
somebody who is highly polarized, somebody who is not that smiley, reassuring figure uh, is suddenly, you know, a, a person of the moment who can catch fire in this extremely polarized media environment. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's a this you know, ongoing debate since, you know, Trump uh, started his political activities, whether he is, you know, the uh, he's playing a 13 dimensional chess, whether he's kind of an idiot savant, um, whether he's like Chance the Gardener. Uh, or Chauncey Gardner from being there, you know, what is he? Is he smart? Is he dumb? Is he demented or what? The th- so the thing he says back, you know, in 1980 um, is like, that is very astute when you, when you think about it, that people want a smiley, a smiley kind of guy, at least they did back then. And, you know, in the, um, it's funny because Trump has this very, um, this very canned smile that he puts on whenever he takes like a photo with a well-wisher or someone who donated $25,000 to his campaign. It's, it's kind of a very phony smile. And he gives like the thumbs up, the, his weird thumbs up like that. Um, yeah. But when he did his official portrait, um, you know, which I assume was taken like January 18th, 2017, he's scowling. And, that, and that's his Twitter avatar now is, this, yes. uh, you know, he's, he's like the badass and he's going to sort things out. But he, but he, he and, and apparently in his mind, it's modeled on Churchill. Uh, <laughs> like okay. he has this idea that like Churchill never smiled. And like that, that, and again, somebody who is like, Always his successes has always been in image and the idea of, you know, what is it that an image conveys to a person to, like to him? That is the brand of like toughness and, you know, yeah, meanness and and the opposite of, of, of weakness and ingratiating this. Yeah. So, I mean, he, yeah. So he, he's, he's he, I mean, he's still very, very consumed with appearance. He, he often says uh, uh, someone is straight out of central casting, describing yeah. the, the, w- the way they look to appoint them to an important position, or the, you know, m- you know, Mad Dog Mattis uh, looks like a grizzled old veteran, and so he's a good person to be Secretary of Defense, and, and then, like, you know, Kirsten Nielsen is, like, a five foot four woman, and so she doesn't look tough enough to be, like, a good, an effective um, Homeland Security yeah. <laughs> Secretary. But anyway, so we're getting a little, a little ahead of ourselves. I just want to touch, so just briefly on the I mean, the 80s is the Trump decade, really. I mean, it, it, until <laughs> until Trump decided to become launch a presidential run, we would yeah, have, yeah, you're right. The Trump biography yeah. would have focused on really the 1980s as like when he when he like he's 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 more of a I mean he's more of a symbol I think of 1980s New York than he is of like 2000s reality TV because like I you know the the you know he was on. Um, the front page, all of his marital like um, stuff and his divorce uh, from his first wife, um, Ivana was on the front page of all the tabloids and he would you know, be showing up in studio 54, the rainbow room or whatever, and have his photograph taken with beautiful women. And just the, the, the like the, the ethos of the decade seemed to meld with the ethos that he had created for himself of, you know, uh, wealth and super abundance and master of the universe Greed is good. Yeah. All the all these other like taglines that have come from pop culture of the of the nineteen eighties. So, so and then you all you have, I mean, compared what you compared the thing the um, treatment of wealth on popular culture in the nineteen eighties of like Dallas and um, and so forth with lifestyles of the rich and famous, which yeah, so you, dynasty, you're on one of the first episodes of um, versus you know the all the family kind of kind of stuff from the seventies that seemed to have more of a you know trying to find middle or lower middle class or lower class people and yeah. exploring their lives. Um, so yeah, okay. So I, I've talked enough. So what, what what do you think about Trump? Trump in the eighties in terms of television. Well, one thing that he has always benefited from, like throughout his career, has been you know tremendously fortunate timing. Uh, and as it turned out, the beginning of the eighties was a tremendously auspicious time to try to launch your career as sort of a, a celebrity media hound businessman, because this is the time that you know not only do you have the election of Ronald Reagan and this sort of zeitgeist feeling of, you know, it's OK to want things again. We're going to bring glamour back to the White House and, you know, the president's not going to wear jeans anymore. We're going to buy new China, uh, you know, and and and, and asp- aspiration and, you know, coveting things is, you know, good. And it's it's American. And you also have uh, this move in popular culture and entertainment, you know, as you say, away from that sort of 60s, post 60s you know, bicentennial area, populist focus on the little guy to this, uh, you know, increasing fascination with figures of wealth, be it like somebody like J.R. Ewing on Dallas uh, to, you know, the uh, the popularity of a show like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, where, you know, Robin Leach, you know, another very sort of prescient 
uh, pop culture figure realized that that wealth was becoming a form of entertainment and celebrity and therefore a source of power in the culture. Uh, you know, to, you know, uh, 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 movies like, like, Caddyshack, which which I, I talk about a bit in the book, where you have figures like Rodney Dangerfield's character, Al Cervic, the real estate developer, uh, who is no longer he's no longer the the um, uh, you know the the villainous rich guy, right? That's more the Ted Knight character in that movie, who's the you know stick up his ass country club guy who looks down on everyone. Rodney Dangerfield is this model of the rich guy, but somebody who you find entertaining and you identify with him because, you know, he can live life his the way he wants to and he's brash and unapologetic and so forth. And and you can see that as as a model in many ways for this, you know, and I use I use this in quotes because it's an artifice, but the blue collar billionaire uh, persona that Donald Trump very much traded on by the time he runs for president. Uh, but, you know, in, in the 80s, uh, his it's it's very fortuitous for him because what he's doing is is building up a brand first through the New York tabloids, then magazines, then local TV, then talk shows. Then, you know, uh, you know, he writes a best selling book. And by the end of the decade, he's, you know, being played by Phil Hartman on, on Saturday Night Live. Uh, it, he's he's building this character as sort of this public face of unimaginable, you know, sort of guy from the Monopoly box wealth. Um, and this character that he builds is, 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 is essential because not only does it, you know, sort of make him famous and build up the Trump brand from the standpoint of whatever, selling condos or, you know, uh, launching business expansions as he does. But when he runs into business trouble and bankruptcies at the end of the decade, um, essentially playing that character kind of becomes the way he keeps himself afloat. So like that character by the end of the decade, has sort of become his job. Right. So, yeah, so this, this is where it becomes – we move into kind of like the postmodern <laughs> aspects of the, of the Trump yeah. story. And um, and I actually did an episode of this show at one point where I debated whether or not Trump was a postmodern figure or not with a um, uh, someone with a philosophy degree uh, who disagreed with me about that. But anyway, he um, – so, yeah, so he – Start, From so, my yeah. dilettante point of view, you're absolutely right about that. Like, if it, whether, whether he is a postmodernist of him, uh, postmodernist himself or not, he's he's he's, he's got to at least be a case study, you know. Yes, but, yeah. I mean, it's, so it's the, you know, he. In some respects, he does. Um, he, he is a rich guy, you know, for some parts of his life, and he does lead the lifestyle that we imagine the rich guy leading. And there's this famous joke that Donald Trump is is the bums uh the the poor person's idea of rich man idea of rich man yeah friend Lee Woods um and so but then he you know runs it he he you know, like he multiple businesses of his have to declare bankruptcy he famously uh <laughs> there's one part of one of his uh subsequent biographies where he is supposedly walking down the street with um, Ivanka and there's a homeless person on the street and he says to her, you know, see that guy over there. He has more money than I do yeah. Um, yeah. because he's so far in the red. But then he so then he um, but he already has established this persona as like money. And you talk about how he is like the, you know, human the, makes himself the human embodiment of wealth um, during the 1980s and then is able to parlay that into um, this series of. You know, television appearances, commercial endorsements, movie appearances, and so he's in all sorts of weird things from the from the nineties. So, you know, like he was in Home Alone two that recently uh, became notable because like a broadcast on CBC or something cut his scene with Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone two, and yeah. and then he's you know he endorses things, and so I, I want to just and so he appears you know he appears on a bunch of sitcoms like Fresh Prince, Drew Carey playing himself. He'll he'll drop in for a cameo. You know, if the character's visiting New York or something, and then Donald Trump is there, and he like you know uses his money to make things work, and so this just further builds the Trump brand. And then you uh, just to read just a very brief expert, excerpt, you note that um, uh, you know he did a lot of endorsements, and um, it's a quote: "You Trump came pre-explained, pre-stereotyped, pre-cartoonified. He was his own Colonel Sanders, a logo, a logo that you at a glance that told you at a glance what flavor to expect." When he made a TV commercial for the Big and Tasty Burger with McDonald's's jiggly purple mascot Grimace, he was collaborating with a peer. Um, so that, that's just a, that's a great line. But also, um, you know, 
like he did, you know, it is bizarre. Like you just Google Trump grimace, you'll see these photos of Trump with grimace. Like, and like they are, they were presented at the time as, you know, more or less the same thing. Like Trump is like daddy Warbucks and yeah. grimace is whatever the hell grimace is. And, um, and so, so Trump, play, yeah, so Trump played this out throughout the, throughout the nineties and, and, but continued to launch all these side businesses that a lot of them didn't really work out like an airline and he tried to buy the xfl or xfl team or something he tried to buy the buffalo bills that didn't work and um you know some of his his land city pro- uh, casino properties uh, went out of business and so yeah but but it, like, it, he was able just to maintain point, yeah at the point that he does his cameo in home alone too with macaulay culkin he is actually being forced to unload the plaza hotel as part of a prepackaged bankruptcy agreement but in the world of the movies he is still the owner of the Plaza Hotel because you need somebody to play that character. He has become this Hollywood shorthand, uh, you know, that uh, that you can insert in a movie or in, you know, the the Fresh Prince of Bel Air or whatever, and that just immediately tells you, oh, that's that rich guy from the TV that I know. You know, that's that's that guy with the gold apartment and supermodel wife. Yeah, that's you know, that's that's the rich guy. This is telling me instantly, you know, oh, okay, this this person in this show is Donald Trump, rich guy who is going to like bring his fabulous riches to bear on the situation. He literally, you know, part of the reason I made that that crack on, you know, about about Grimms is that literally like his job sort of becomes to be the mascot of himself. He's playing the idea of Donald Trump, and that keeps him alive in the public consciousness and makes him very useful as this sort of semi parodic figure who shows up in entertainment shows and so on, even at times when he is, you know, objectively, you know, kind of a business failure uh, and you know, deeply, tremendously in debt. Basically, the idea of him, the character of him, uh, has to to bail out the actual Donald Trump and keeps his image and his reputation alive, you know, through this period when his his business is doing very poorly. And, you know, how valuable is that? You know, well, for one thing, why, I'm sure we're, we're like, you know, moving, mo- moving on to this uh, 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 eventually, but when somebody is looking to cast a reality show about business, you know, the first thing you think of, oh, is who's that guy who looks like a businessman, right? right. Because because that's what works for that kind of job. Not necessarily somebody who actually is a business success, which can look very bland and boring, but you want, you want the guy with cufflinks, you know, with the gold tower with his name on it in, you know, with all these props. And his, the first couple of decades of his, public life has just been amassing props and playing this sort of, you know, simulacrum of American business uh, as, as a public performer. Right. So let, let's hold off on Apprentice for one moment. There's one yeah, or two yeah. other things I want to hit. So one is just that, um, I don't know if you noted this one in the book, but there's a scene. So they made a Little Rascals remake reboot in the 90s that I remember seeing. I think they made... I could be wrong about this. I think they made two of them. One of the little yeah. rascals' kids was like the rich little rascal, and they styled yeah. him to look like Trump with like a big, like big blonde hair, and he's always wearing a suit, even though he's like seven years old. And then I think in the second Little Rascals movie, there was some point where they needed like a cash infusion to like save the orphanage or whatever, and and the little kid rascal uh, takes out his you know giant cell phone from 1994 and he calls up his dad, and who's his dad? It's Donald Trump. Um, yeah. 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 So he was yeah, like, so that's like, you know, there's multiple through the looking glass moments here where they created like a mini, mini Donald Trump to indicate that the kid was rich. And then, but then actual Donald Trump does appear and, and, you know, he's on screen for like seven seconds and, you know, I'm sure he got his like hundred thousand um, dollar payday or whatever um, for that yeah. one. The Biff Tannen figure in Back to the Future 2 after he when he becomes rich in the future of the movie is basically styled to look like yes. Donald Trump. And, and again, it's the, the sort of, you know, big, you know, golden helmet of hair. You know, again, that's that's sort of like branding. It's like the Nike swoosh, like Donald Trump, like through this public branding and performance kind of essentializes himself down to these visual gestures and, you know, sort of essentials of performance that tell you kind of in a few strokes, here's what this, here's what this brand is, here's what this familiar figure is, and here's what it stands for. It stands for this kind of like, you know, commedia dell'arte like figure of the, you know, sort of comical but enviably wealthy business success. Yeah. Can you, is there anyone else 
in the past 100 years who has done this in the way he has. I'm trying to think. Like, maybe Michael Jackson of the 90s. So, someone who, like, tur- like created the like created the image and then became that became like the shorthand or the cartoon version of of the image I, uh, no but even jackson doesn't really fit it because he changed the, the, so many times the thing with the thing with michael jackson was that he was also like you know a, a child prodigy and extremely uh, uh, talented and uh, in other words you know obviously there was certain certainly a a calculated prefab aspect behind, you know, making the Jackson five into stars and, 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 and so on. But it's sort of the, the image that we think of now, when we think of Michael Jackson, that, that in a way came after or evolved at the same time that he was, you know, building the same, you know, career in a way, I, I, I sort of tend to think of him. There are probably other past examples who are not uh, leaping to mind at this point, but as kind of a precursor, of, uh, you know, somebody like um, like Kim Kardashian in the, you know, in the social media and, and influencer era uh, who, you know, has become a very, you know, successful business person and, and sort of, you know, media empire, but sort of does this by establishing the fame first and then building an empire to match that fame. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe uh, Kim Kardashian, her, you know, she is the embodiment of sex in the way yeah. that Trump was the embodiment of money at one point. Um, you know, the two things that <laughs> everyone wants in life. And, you know, they, yeah. they met, they've met they met in the Oval Office multiple times. So so there you go. OK, so what it all comes, it all comes full circle. Right. So, the, so one just one other thing before we get to The Apprentice, which is yeah. um, David Letterman and yeah. um Trump's relationship with David Letterman. Now, actually, a couple of years ago, did a conversation with uh, your colleague uh, Jason Zinneman, who wrote the uh, a very fine um, biography great book on Letterman, of yeah. Letterman. I think it's called "The Last Giant of Late Night," um, and we can link to that. But I asked him about Trump at that point, and he said, "You know, um, you know, d- like Letterman saw Trump as essentially one of the other like cast of characters, a sort of weird people like Larry Bud Melman, who he yeah. would bring on." And they would do something silly, and Ed Letterman would be like, "Wow, like this was television. We put this on the air." Uh, so, so like there was one point where some, like someone was throwing footballs over a building, and Trump was trying to catch them on like you know West Fifty Seventh Street or whatever. And uh, but then like he would often you know, and I think in later years, and especially once The Apprentice came on, he would have Trump on, and he would kind of make fun of him for some length of time, and Trump would just do his like shitty and grin thing. But then he would let Trump go off on whatever, like, the outrage of the day was, you know, the Ground Zero Mosque or whatever, and let him, you know, pump up his bona fides as a right-wing, you know, right-wing guy. And I, so I think, I, I know Trump it, or uh, Letterman has expressed regret about whatever role he played in helping to, to elevate um, elevate Trump. But what, you know, what, what do you think about yeah. how Letterman played a role? I mean, it's, it's a two-edged thing, right? Because I think that, you know, Letterman is the sort of figure who did a lot to pump up Trump and, you know, make, you know, the, the, like the, 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 the brand and the celebrity of somebody like that possible. I think by the same token, he, you know, he ultimately, and I know Jason has, has written about this also, he, uh, I think because he is somebody who is, you know, of the world of pop culture and knows how like important and influential was. He was also one of the first people to take Trump's racism seriously and would call him out on him in so many words. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, he was one of the first figures to call, uh, to, to uh, r- really, and uh, you know, in strong terms, call him out on birtherism on his talk show when, you know, a lot of people still sort of viewed Trump as just kind of this buffoon who was, uh, you know, dabbling in, in, in politics. Um, you know, but certainly in those, those early years, you know, Trump was this, you know, kind of figure of fun and this guy who was always game and was available to be on the air and appear, appeared there a lot. And, you know, obviously the thing that, you know, we really associate with Letterman uh, and his show of the 80s and 90s, especially, and that era of comedy and talk show is irony, right? And, and irony is a cultural force, especially, you know, going into the 90s. Uh, you know, this idea of, you know, sort of being in on the joke and, and, and winking to the audience um, and, you know, 
elevating and mocking a, 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 a thing at the same time. Uh, you know, David Foster Wallace wrote a lot about about you know Letterman as sort of the the patient zero of cultural irony, and you know I think that there's kind of an interesting um, parallel there between that and that that show that environment that Trump thrived in and Trump's sort of approach to himself as a public figure and later as a politician because you know we talked a little bit about how. You know, Trump kind of survived the 90s as this sort of ironic, you know, cocky, arrogant, but also kind of slightly self-parodic figure of of entertainment. And there is, I think, a line between that sort of, you know, talk show character image where, you know, you can go on a show and say something outrageous. And then if it goes a little too far and the audience gasps, like when he joked about having Mike Tyson box at one of his casinos after Tyson's rape conviction, uh, you know, you can then say, yeah, when I say that, I'm only joking, folks, I'm just I'm speaking as an as an entertainer mm-hmm. um, again, like. You can very much draw a line to that and the Donald Trump of the campaign trail. Uh, this, you know, the session where he holds these rallies that are, you know, at the same time demagogic and kind of like, uh, uh, you know, insult comedy, uh, uh, you know, that like a like a Don Rickles type in, insult comedy fest, uh, you know, where you kind of thrive on living being able to occupy the space where I'm joking, but I'm not joking. And you can take it totally seriously if that works for you, but you can say, take me literally, you know, seriously, but not literally if you want to take it that way. Uh, you know, and I think that that sort of ironized presentation, which he kind of learned as a businessman entertainer in the nineties, it kind of became a part of like the, the DNA of his performance that he learned how to use and still uses, you know, in politics today. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to me. And he, 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 you know, he continues to get away with stuff that any other person in the world saying it, um, they would be, you know, tarred and feathered. Where you know, he's just like, ah, you know, it's just Trump. He's just saying, you know, whatever he wants to yeah, say. And, and it appeals to your fan base, right? Because you know, part of the appeal of you know irony as sort of a, a comedic form is that you're telling your audience that they're in on the joke and you know, that they get it and they're not, you know, sufficiently saps or rubes to be offended by it. Uh, and it turns out that you can, you know, if you're good enough at that, translate that very effectively to politics. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let's do The Apprentice next. So I I okay. want to briefly share my Apprentice experience, which was I was in college when the show came on, so I, I kind of had stopped, you know, watching TV because I didn't have time because I was uh, you know studying all the time. Yeah. Uh, but we kind of made a carve out, uh, my friends and I, for some of the Thursday night uh, NBC shows, and then Apprentice came on, and we all became obsessed with it. This is the first season, so it would have been two thousand four, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I, I was a I was a junior in college, I think, and I, um, and it was just a great great show. We like yeah. you know all of our friends. It was like a point the only appointment viewing really we we had. We'd all assemble in a, in a dorm common room and watch it, and uh, it was the the first season or two. Like they really did a good job of finding these strange people to be the contestants. Uh, as you know, Trump is not really in it that much in the first season. He's kind of a uh, godlike presence uh, hovering over the the uh, activities, which is kind of like the you know the, they have to do all these competition stunt t- kind of things yeah. all the time. But Trump will descend and um, like sometimes literally like a little, you know, helicopter will come in and he'll step off the helicopter um, or down the escalator or whatever, and he uh, issues some brief commandments and um, and then recedes, and you you actually have a funny part in the in the book where you compare it to like you know uh, Catholic liturgy of the mass or something. These yeah. those, re- these repeated parts of the episodes in which you know, the Trump the the wisdom of Trump is is imparted. Um, so it was a great show. But one thing I remember when I was watching it is uh, you know so it all come down to the boardroom uh, you know and I noticed very early on that there were parts where you would see Trump talking. And then there were parts where they would cut to someone else who was sitting in the room and you'd hear a voiceover of Trump. And mm. it was very clear that Trump was reading off of a page 
and it was edited at, in after the fact um, yeah. while that was happening. And I would always annoy my friends where I'd be like, that's not Trump. He, like, he's doing it later. This is fake. Um, yeah. This is still in the early part of like reality TV where it was like, fun to point out how it was, you know, we had it all totally accepted that it was fake to begin with. But um, it, you know, came out, you know, it came out later on and there was a piece in the New Yorker about this that, you know, Trump would, um, Trump would choose to fire, or eliminate one of the contestants, sometimes like randomly, or he like didn't like the way they were dressed or something. And then the editors would have to like go back through the footage and assemble a narrative of um, showing them doing something bad so that there was some right. ostensible reason besides just like Trump didn't like them because of how they dressed or because of their race or gender and um, to justify uh, sending them, sending them on their way. And then they masterfully edited it all together so that, it made sense, even though like you, you could detect through these voiceovers and stuff, because Trump is very bad at reading text off of a piece of paper. Uh, he has a, a very phony like reading reading voice. It's very different from his speaking voice. And, and you can you can see that again now, like if if when he's reading off a teleprompter as opposed to just riffing off the top of his head. Yeah, it's it's like total. Yeah, he has two to, two totally different voices. Obviously, yeah. hasn't seemed to hurt him that much. Um, but you know, this New Yorker piece, which we'll link to, indicated that you know the show like was even faker than the, the average reality TV show was because when they first approached Trump to do this, like his office was very shabby and all the furniture was nicked up because it had been replaced in 25 years. And, you know, Trump himself would often was rambly and, um, you know, so it, there's just this prefiguration of what has played out in the world of, uh, current events, national politics and foreign affairs. You know, Trump decides to um, drone strike General Soleimani, and afterwards they come up with a couple of different explanations. Maybe it was that he was threatening embassies. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it wasn't four embassies. Maybe it was one embassy. You know, maybe it was this thing. Maybe it was that thing. We'll see what sticks. And uh, you know, his his base is along will, will eat up anything he shovel he, he in the White House shovel out. So they accept it, and then it's like uh, on to the next thing with the you know the semi mad king <laughs> at the yeah. top. Somebody has to go back and ret retroactively edit logic onto his uh, his his decisions. Yeah, why why did we abandon the Kurds? Why did you know? Why is you know whatever statistic he threw out off the top of his head on you know in a Twitter rant technically true? Uh, you know the the, the the thing is that you know of course now you you're able to see a lot of that quote unquote editing on the fly. Uh, carried it doesn't out. work as well guys, in real where, life, <laughs> you know. On The Apprentice, and which I will agree with you, was like a great show, particularly its first couple of seasons. Uh, you know, this is a Mark Burnett production, producer of Survivor, a show that I still watch religiously. Uh, you know, like he is 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 you know great at uh, you know casting and conducting a seamless narrative. And you know, honestly, like a lot of the artifice that goes on in that, you know, is not different from. A lot of things that, you know, other reality shows do and then other reality shows have their own forms of dishonesty, you know, whether it's, you know, dating shows, getting people really drunk so that, you know, they'll act out or, 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 or whatever. But uh, what, what you have with with The Apprentice here that, you know, kind of becomes politically significant for America eventually is that it shares a common interest with Donald Trump in building on and maintaining the illusion of Trump as, you know, uh, not just wealthy and, you know, having a fabulous lifestyle, but being decisive uh, and, you know, and, and wise and intuitive and his, you know, judgment is unfailing and people are seeking out his approval because, you know, like, like any TV show, The Apprentice needs to be the best wants to be the best reality show on network TV to be the best reality show. It has to have the best prize, right? And Donald Trump is the prize. Uh, you know, it's, I write about this some um, in, in the book, but as you were talking about sitting around with your friends in college, like, you know, noticing the edits in, in reality TV, uh, you know, I honestly, you know, and, and there's in polling and, and, and interviews and studies on this contrary to popular belief. I think reality TV fans are actually highly conscious of the fact that, there is a level of artifice in these shows and that they're edited and that they are contrived in some ways. And in fact, that's part of the appeal of it, as you, as you described, kind of, you know, like you know, figuring out the game and the sleight of hand in your own head is, is part of the, the, the appeal of watching. But the great thing that The Apprentice does for Trump 
is that he's the premise of the game. He's not necessarily the place where, you know, people are looking for artifice. In, in other words, the fact that he has a big business and owns a lot of properties and people would do anything to work for him, uh, you know, and he has a, a fabulous life and is a model of success. Um as as much as the apprentice exaggerated that in order to you know build up his his image, it's sort of taken as a given there, and and you kind of tend to look for the sleight of hand on the part of the contestants and the the, the challenges, and is the editing you know being you know uh, leading me to think that Omarosa is going to be voted off this week, but it's really going to be Sam Sullivan, you know, like like that that sort of thing, um, but it it uh, but it does you know an, an excellent job of just creating this atmospheric image in American living rooms week after week for, for over a decade of Donald Trump decisive businessman in a fabulous setting right down to, as, as, as you say, this boardroom that they constructed for him that was modeled on the boardroom scene in the movie network <laughs> where, where, where Ned, Ned Beatty chews out uh, Howard Beale, uh, you know, and, and just like in that uh, on, on, on that, that movie set, it's constructed to use all these symbols and imagery of power. It's dark and, you know, and there's a long table uh, and there are, you know, accents of, 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 of gold and little stacks of paper that, you know, nobody, nobody ever uses <laughs> all to sort of, you know, convey the image that, you know, this is just this is the the the, the heart of competency and judgment. And all that sort of ends up accruing to the character at its center, Donald Trump, who ends up becoming the sort of breakout character of the show. Right. Um so the, I mean, just just to know, I mean, one of the funniest things connected to the way the uh, apprentice created his persona is he actually um, does not like firing people, and he'll yeah. often um, he will treat them badly and berate them until they quit. Um, yeah, hope they quit or or delegate the job to somebody else. Uh, yeah, uh, that, yeah. Honestly, the whole you know, quick, you're fired. Uh, is is one of the greatest fictions that the show created for him. Yeah. Okay. So, would you say that what what? Okay. So there's a, there's like one or two more things, including cable news and, and maybe social media that we could discuss. But of all the things we discussed so far, I would say it's The Apprentice that is the linchpin of leading to his political rise. If you took out The Apprentice, let's say they had asked you know um, another celebrity to be the head of the show and then it failed. Um, and there was no reality star Donald Trump, he would not be president today. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, with the caveat that, like, I sort of look at this as as building blocks. It's really like, you know, like a kind of a f for the want of a nail chain of events. You know, in other words, you know, without his tabloid fame in New York, he doesn't have, you know, the sort of broader showbiz fame in Hollywood. Without that, he doesn't have reality TV. Without reality TV, he doesn't become a figure on Fox News. Without Fox News, he doesn't run for president. But I, but I think if you take – if you take – um you know, the apprentice out of that chain, then yes, because th that provides the link that makes him a national television star and legitimate celebrity who then becomes more in demand in the, the cable news world when he seeks that out and allows him to, you know, sort of leverage that, uh, leverage that into, uh, uh, you know, actual political influence without that. He's just sort of another nostalgia figure who, you know, he might like occasionally pop up on a Fox show to you know offer his opinion, like you know Gene Simmons does, you know nowadays or whatever. <laughs> uh, but you know he would be the guy who used to be Donald Trump in the eighties, if not for if not for The Apprentice. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, well let's let's quickly just hit like social media and cable news. Um, you you find you found Trump's first uh, tweet from the real Donald Trump account, which I'd never seen before. Which is actually it says something like, "Watch Donald Trump uh, uh, deliver the top ten list on the David Letterman show." Yeah, it's about tonight. a TV. It's of course, yeah, yeah. Which is just like you know, so the, <laughs> perfectly great for that. Obviously, he's a social media innovator, and I mean Twitter, you know, also important to his rise for maybe stranger reasons. Um, and you know how Twitter interacts with TV is mostly just like he would tweet something crazy and then the cable news networks felt the need to like 
amplify that uh, beyond the number of people who are actually on Twitter, which I suspect is not very many at any given time. Um, and then, I mean, you have a, a very good chapter about his, his rallies, and I think it's called The Red Light, uh, yeah. referencing the, you know, when the, when the cameras are streaming directly to uh, the screen, um, he, sees, he sees a red light. Um, it's the light on the camera that tells you that, it's, that you're on live. Yeah, yeah, you're on live. And so he, he knows how to keep that red light on and not have it turned off so they switch to something else. And, you know, the, the cable news networks gave Trump rallies, like they would just air them, you know, give him an hour of free time in the middle of the day all throughout 2016 because they were like, you know, this is he's going to he might say something crazy. Like, what's he going to do next? If he says something crazy, ever, everyone, you know, it's going to be worth it that we're showing this. And also, like, he just will talk continuously. So it, it fills the time. They don't need to, like, create <laughs> create actual news content um, to, to fill one of the 24 hours. So that so that helped him a lot. Just his, his mastery, in the sense of, like, what people want to hear so that they're not like, I can't flip away from this. Something might happen. Yeah. And what, and what are the appetites of the camera? You know, just just heard it quickly about cable news. I won't rehearse that whole chapter because we want to give people a reason to buy the book. Uh, you know, but, but um, the, the business model of cable TV is it's 24 hours and you have to solve this problem. Of how do you get an audience to watch all the time, even if there are not really things going on. Well, you know how you do this. You, you agitate them and you sort of inflate events and you create the notion that, you know, something is is happening that you need to be anxious about, even if it's not necessarily. And for, you know, in that environment, you know, it's not ju- it's not just Fox News, you know, particularly in the 2016 campaign. Uh, you know, it, it's Donald Trump is like, you know, a, a, a plane that crashes every day. You know, he's, he's like just just the fact that suddenly this this outlandish pop culture figure is running for president and saying, you know, horrifying, appalling, offensive things at the drop of the hat and building this following. And you never know what he'll say next when, when he opens his mouth. That's just that's just manna. For, for cable news. And, you know, part of what makes him so successful in making himself into the protagonist of the campaign is what has aided him through his whole celebrity career, which is this intuitive sense of what the camera is hungry for. And, you know, with, with the electronic news industry, it's, you know, something more, something more outrageous than you said the last time, something dangerous, something provocative. And, if you are not somebody who, like a lot of traditional politicians, is tethered to the old pr- proprieties of having gravitas or saying things that are responsible or worrying about, you know, losing face or, or making gaffes, uh, you know, if, if you believe instead that there's just no such thing as pe- bad publicity, then you can feed that, you know, that sort of bottomless mouth all the time. And that's, you know, that's what he's he's able to do, you know, the, the symbol of, of the red light for me, you know, which was where he, he, he told the Washington Post after his election that when he was at his rallies, uh, you know, a lot of times he wouldn't so much pay attention to the people at the rallies, but he said, you know, if, if, he, if he sensed the energy trying to flag, I'd say something new to keep the red light on. It, it's like it's like this flame that he knows he has to keep feeding and fueling. Um, and his ability to do that keeps the focus of attention on him throughout the 2016 election. He becomes the figure that dominates the storyline and everybody else has talked about in relation to him or how they're reacting to him or what they're saying about him. Yeah. Um, so, okay, why don't we, why don't we skip ahead to Trump as president? You, you, your chapter references this famous in some worlds um, tweet from pixelated boat, who is a <laughs> Twitter yeah. account. That's a cartoonist. And he faked up this, uh, well, we won't even get into it, but it's called the Gorilla Channel. People can Google Gorilla Channel if they want to find out more about this. Uh, somewhat um, realistic, somewhat um, absurd uh, joke <laughs> that this guy did. But I think, I mean, I think the interesting thing, like, since Trump has, it's almost like, well, like, there is an irony to it. It's like a postmodern one. Like, since Trump has become president, like, he, he was he was once the master of the television, and now he seems the slave of the television. He yeah. Like, he watches TV nonstop. He cares more about keeping the Fox News hosts happy with him than he cares about the voters in Ohio happy with him. Uh, you know, he it seems like though, like, you know, there's uh, 
news news hosts from Fox like come in and ask these special favors that are not politically popular, like uh, pardoning uh, uh, people from the military who are convicted of war crimes. Uh, you know, there's, there's like special pleading, and he'll do it because like they're his friends. Um, and yeah, I mean he. It, like he, you know, the most powerful man in the world seems to watch like six to eight hours of TV every day, which is just totally absurd. Um, yeah, he's, he's elected through his mastery of TV, but he's also mastered by it. And that's why, you know, I, I try to keep emphasizing it, it is sort of a, a symbiotic relationship where, you know, it's like it, it is more like a biological connection than it is, you know, the, the old idea of, you know, this sort of mastermind who uses the media as a tool, you know, like the Big Brother 1984 model, but is actually but stands separate from it. Uh, you know, I, I, I say this in the book, but I, you know, kind of think and I think this partly becomes comes from being a, a critic and I can only talk in terms of metaphors. But, you know, for me, when you look at Trump and his relation to television, the model is not really like Big Brother in 1984 and Orwell so much as it is like the one ring and the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> you know, where the one ring is this like this tremendously powerful object that confers a great deal of power on its user, but it also possesses them and it makes them its its slave and they become addicted to it. Uh, and, and they are as much con- or more controlled by it as they are able to control it. And I think with Trump's presidency, that, that has very broadly uh, been the case. You know, he certainly uses television in some ways, uses it very powerfully, but he is also very much his emotions and his actions and the priorities and actions of his administration are often you know, determined by it. You know, we got into a government shutdown basically because, you know, the host of Fox and Friends said that he was being a wuss in the budget negotiations. Uh, you know, so it's the, the you know, it, there is there is an element to his presidency of, you know, with with outlets like Fox News of sort of you know, state run media. But there is also certainly an element of the media running the state. Yeah, that's how I've thought about it, too, that in, you know, North Korea, the, the state decides what appears on television. And in, in America, in 2020, the television decides what happens uh, with the leverage yeah. of state. Um, and then, you know, just it makes me think of um, a little bit of the, you know, the, the central metaphor in uh, Dave Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest of the the, th- the entertainment that is so, um, so entertaining that you watch it until you die. Um, yeah. You can't, you know, you just want to watch it over and over again and then you starve to death or you would you would chop off your own toes in order to keep watching it. It's, it's just so great. Um, and that was his. You know, that was Wallace's reaction to, uh, you know, even before, like, the Internet and Twitter and social media existed. That was just TV. Um, it is interesting that, that you know, Trump um, is, you know, it seems like um, social media, smartphones, computers are somewhat replacing TV. And Trump is still in the TV era. I, I have a theory that he's never actually used a computer once in his life. You know, he, use, he does Twitter on his phone. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's more than theory. I mean, I, I don't know if it's proven, but, you know, I think there I've, – I've seen several people say that he has never, like, never sent, never sent an email, does not generally use laptops or computers. Like, he has somebody to do that for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in some ways he is in – if we think that, like, social media and the internet is going to supplant television and maybe for the sake of your career, I, that's, I hope that's not true, and also for the sake of humanity, um, it just seems like he he's – he is in this earlier paradigm, even though he does use Twitter, obviously, but the Twitter really only gets amplified when it's like the, um, you know, he could use Twitter like he could have used a website in 1996. It's only when, like, the news picks up on what he's doing that it really gets gets amplified. So I, I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, but. yeah I mean, I, I think social media and Twitter are, you know, significant. I, as, you know, I don't want to to downplay that. And I do like, you know, as you say, there's 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 a chapter on, on, on in the book on its, its relationship to this. But I do think that there is an element where. Um, Trump's election and the campaign of, of 2016, in a way, it was almost sort of like a rear guard action in the culture where th- the influence of, of television and cable TV in the culture had seemed to be waning, but it kind of reinf- reaffirmed the power, at least for now, of this this legacy form of media, A, because it has 
such a spellbinding influence on the most powerful man in the world now. And number two, because while there are certainly unique properties of Twitter and social media and how they select audiences and, you know, uh, allow people to, you know, sort of uh, amplify and, uh, uh, you know, re, re surround themselves by people who share their beliefs and so on. Um, many of the ways in which Trump's Twitter feed is so powerful is that it programs the television that, you know, he tweets something. And if you, you watch any cable news, you know, that sets the morning's agenda for CNN and CNBC and, and, and Fox News and so on. And then that in turn, you know, is is being consumed by the TV watcher in chief in the White House. And he tweets about it more. Uh, and, and, and and so he in some ways he uses Twitter as much like a like a remote control <laughs> as, he just, as a communications device in in itself. Yeah. Uh, and he's you know, he, he, he has um given like orders that would have been like published in the you know, federal register or whatever the proper way to do it is like he's tweeted it before that has happened or anyone knew that was going to happen. Um, okay. Maybe something related to, oh, I'm sorry. I think there was, there was something related to, I think it was maybe the Soleimani attack or something like that. Uh, just very recently, I wish I could remember the specific example, but where he he sent out a tweet that was worded to the effect of like this media post signifies as notice that such and such and such. Yes. Yeah, that was that was strange for sure. And yeah. I, I, well, we'll see what happens with that one. It seems I mean, he, a lot of stuff he does that's weird kind of just gets forgotten and ignored. Um, and because it can't actually like uh, you know turn into reality quite yet. Um, okay, but here's a, maybe this is the final question. So what what do you think that Trump understood about television in 2016 that Hillary Clinton and her campaign didn't understand about television, and that whoever runs against him in 2020 should understand about television? Um, I think that uh, the smoothness and control of a production doesn't matter as much culturally as it used to. And in some ways it can even be uh, a liability. Like if you just, you know, getting beyond the differences in politics and all the, the, you know, factors of xenophobia and sexism and so on that played into that campaign. Like when you just look aesthetically at the Clinton campaign versus the Trump campaign, uh, you know, like the, 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 Clinton Democratic National Convention was, by traditional standards, light years a better production than Republican National Campaign, which was sort of this scene of chaos and ugly displays of emotions, and it ran long, and not all the like lighting worked, and 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 so on. Um, but there is an you know there is an element of sort of chaos equals opportunity in that, and <laughs> uh-huh. and. and, and uh, you know, a notion that this chaotic environment to a certain audience signals authenticity and and you know sort sort of uh, grabs attention more than a kind of slickly controlled presentation with you know carefully portioned out, professionally produced celebrity endorsement videos uh, and, and so forth. Um, you know, so I think I think that's a part of it, and I think the other thing just just essentially. Um, I don't know if it was, you know, that he understood it or was simply like better equipped to do this in this media environment. But uh, there is a great power to making yourself the protagonist of an election, to making yourself the, you know, the center of attention, even if the attention isn't always positive, because it gives you a form of control than if you're the person who is always doing the reacting. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, something that Trump has long lived by is like, he would rather people be talking about him in a negative sense than that they were not talking about him at all. It's better to be talked about. No attention is bad attention. Yes. And and that's, that is, that is something that, you know, that's like a byword of reality TV, right? Like that's how as as a reality TV contestant, you avoid getting lost in, in the edit and, and being forgettable. And it was how Trump, for instance, approached the Republican debates, you know, which were in many ways kind of like an elimination based reality contest <laughs> uh-huh. where the, the point was to stand out uh, and, and make sure you didn't get lost in the edit. Yeah. Uh, OK, I think we should wrap up there. Um, so the book is Audience of One, subtitled Donald Trump Television and the Fractioning of America. 
Uh, so thank you very much, James. I think this was an interesting conversation, and probably people who listen to it, I think, will want to check out the book. Um, so, uh, and uh, anything, I mean, should, do, are you a Twitter person? Are you, uh, do you want to mention any social media or anything like that? Oh, yeah, I'm on Twitter, at Ponawazik, uh, P-O-N-I-E-W-O-Z-I-K. Uh Feel free to get out there and yell at me. Uh, that's what it's for. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, but yeah, I I am on. I, I've been trying to like reduce my my not not quit Twitter, but reduce my use to a healthy amount. Uh, and uh, you know that's going so so. so yeah, so. I don't know what the healthy amount is. It might be zero, honestly. Um, and so if you want to see what I do on Twitter, it's uh, a r y h c w. And, uh, okay, so thanks to all of our viewers and listeners. Uh, Thank you again, James, and we'll see you again next time. Yeah, great talk. Thanks a lot.